That's great. Thank you very much. And thank you so much for inviting me. This is uh, my sixth time in Ghana. And uh, the first time, though, I got to be a tourist yesterday. So if you haven't been a tourist, definitely well worth going out to look at everything. Um, I'm actually not an ethicist, but a nephrologist. And I was asked to really talk about ethical implications and sort of I wanted to give an example in kidney transplantation. And it's really more from a clinician perspective and how I sort of think about things. Um, I just have some disclosures with funding from Vertex. And I wanted to give this case. This was actually a really interesting medical student who we met on a call with the National Kidney Foundation when we were working, again, talking about the controversies of genetic testing and kidney disease. And she told us this story, and it's really stuck with me because I really think about it all the time when I think about genetic testing. Um, she found out that she was a carrier for high-risk APOL1. She was prevented from donating to her mother. Um, but no one could tell her her own long-term risk and what she needed to do to prevent chronic kidney disease. And if she donates, no one could tell her what was her risk with having a single kidney. She now felt like a ticking time bomb and really was upset with the medical community and really told us off as nephrologists in a very nice way, but really told us, like, what were we doing when we thought about genetic testing? And no one actually considered what would happen to her mother because now she felt that her mother was never going to get a kidney transplant because she didn't have a daughter who could donate to her, and there was a long wait list for her to get a kidney transplant, and she was concerned that she was not going to die on dialysis. And what was her life going to be without her mother? And so I think about these things all the time when I think about genetic testing and really trying to make sure that we think through what we should um, do because I believe strongly in thinking about APOL1 and studying it, but really when it takes it to the patient level and when we start saying this is what we're going to do when we do genetic testing, not just for a research perspective, what else should we think about? So really what's the clinical utility of genetic testing when there's so much research that's currently pending, some really important work that we need to have done that will really implicate uh, or give us implications about what we should do in clinical practice? What's the risk when the uh, prevalence varies from country to country, uh, penetrance varies, and there are other gene or environmental factors that are important? What happens when there's medical uncertainty, psychological impact of testing, and what's actually actionable? So what I think happens really is that as clinicians, we really think about testing. Sometimes we just want to know. We're okay with medical uncertainty because we actually gather a ton of information about patients to put a story together to decide about how to treat patients. So we feel okay having medical uncertainty. We really want to understand, though, now that things are actionable, because now there's a trial that you can actually treat a patient with a drug, which is great. You can use it diagnostically. You can also do preventative genetic testing. What I won't discuss today, though, is anything related to familial testing or, or reproductive testing. For the patients, though, it's really important that we think about autonomy, equity, confidentiality, and justice. And I think these are the four principles that are there for clinical genetic testing. And I'm not sure, I think that we're definitely making inroads and getting that um, information, but I think we've got a long way to go. So I'm just going to use APOL1 testing in the U.S. transplant population. And I haven't shown any of the data to say why transplant was important, but Barry Friedman's here who's done a lot of that work and is leading the Apollo study to really understand what's the risk of the, for the donors, for themselves as, long, as living donors, and also for the recipients who are receiving kidneys with APOL1 risk. But what's happened in the transplant community, which has been great, is that a lot of sequential work has happened from 2017 to 2024. And it's sort of built up the case of what should we actually know and what should we actually do regarding um, transplantation. And what I think is important is that um, most recently there's a Delphi consensus of 27 patients, donors, surgeons, nephrologists, and genetic counselors, of which the majority identified as black and African American. And what I liked about the study, which is just recently published in CJSON, was that um, it really was getting patients with donors, surgeons, nephrologists, and genetic counselors. It wasn't just studying one group alone. It was really taking everyone together to come up with a consensus and try to actually frame what we should actually be thinking about. So what was really consistent among all those studies, no matter what um, group you took a look at, was autonomy and testing was incredibly critical for the individual patient. Return of results and decision-making based on those results are shared with the patient and the clinician. But education was also vital for patients, families, and all clinicians. And this was a recurring theme that happened through all the studies. It was also important for engagement with patients, families, and communities to develop culturally appropriate education and type of methods, address concerns of study design, approach, and returning of results. <laughs> 
What was not included, though, was it was very U.S.-centric or North American-centric. It didn't talk about Europe, Australia, and it didn't ever discuss Africa. And so one of the things that I think is a gap in this whole area is that we haven't really discussed all the ethical implications for transplantation globally, but have really focused primarily in the U.S. The other thing that we need to think about is other perceptions that are different in both how you teach people, how you think about health beliefs, what you think about transplantation, and that differs globally. And so we need to make sure that we address that as well. So the study that came out in 2024 uh, up there on the left is part of the sub-study of the Apollo study. Um, and the Apollo study has a community advisory council, and this is the website that it has. Um, but then it did this formal sort of Delphi consensus, and I gave an editorial for that. The reason I wanted to go over it was that it really had two rounds of educational webinars, and it turned out that it not only had to educate patients, but it had to educate really the clinicians as well, and even genetic counselors, to really understand what were the implications with it. They went through three rounds of surveys, and in fact, what was so interesting was how often they could never come to consensus. In fact, it was very difficult to because it was so controversial and there were so many gaps still. But where they were able to come to consensus was they wanted to ask potential donors about African ancestry rather than race. They wanted to make testing decisions only after discussion with the donors. And the donors were encouraged but not required to disclose the results of blood tests to relatives or organ recipients. And then it was a shared decision-making approach so that you actually shared decision-making with both the patients and the providers about whether you would go to transplant. So the patient that I presented at the beginning would never have had a unilateral decision made for her where she was not allowed to donate to her mother, but that would have been a conversation with her and her provider to decide whether that should happen or not. So I thought that the paper was really well done and that it was still a relatively small group, and there were definitely things that were not quite addressed. But one of the questions I had about genetic testing to only those that self-report African ancestry, what we know in Africa is that Africa is not monolithic, and variability and prevalence of APOL1 differs between countries and within ethnic groups. And what's interesting was, hopefully with H3Africa, you'll see soon some data to show you that even within West Africa, it can vary between different ethnic groups within a country, and it can be quite dramatic. It isn't just 20% versus 17%. It could be 2% versus 25%. And so just saying that you're from West Africa alone doesn't guarantee that you're going to be carrying the APOL1 gene. We also have countries in the U.S. that are regions in the U.S. where there's large populations. So I think about Minnesota or I think about Ohio where large Somalian groups have emigrated. If you come from Somalia, your APOL1 prevalence is extremely low. And so how are we going to understand what it means to be African ancestry, even in North America? I think that's really complicated. And so I would actually argue that perhaps we shouldn't really think about asking people, why don't we just make it a standard test? And everyone should get tested, because they don't really know where everybody comes from. I mean, Kirk knows he's 60% Nigerian and 40% Guinean, but is that really true or not? I don't know, you know? But I think it's interesting that people know, but sometimes you don't know. We also know that there's a lot of admixture coming from the Caribbean and Brazil, and Hispanic persons also carry APOL1, again, because of admixture. And so if we don't screen everybody, then we're going to actually not find those that could actually benefit, benefit from a potential drug, benefit from transplantation, and we should think about that. Admixture is also increasing globally. I, re I think about this a lot because my children are mixed heritage. I think lots of people in this room have children who are mixed heritage. And we continue to have this mixture over time. The question is, over the next decade, that's going to change. So we don't need to think about that yet. But in a decade or two decades, of what we decide or what we study, how relevant will that be, given that ad admixture is changing? The other thing that the study didn't do was it didn't really talk about the psychological stress as a result of uncertainty of risk. So because we don't know certain things, we feel comfortable as clinicians feeling uncertain, but it's really impactful to patients, and I think we need to really understand what that means. If you're a high-risk carrier, but in fact you have no proteinuria, and what does the, what's the impact of that? We also need to raise the issue of ongoing education because there's evolving epidemiology. We keep learning all the time. And we're learning now about protective variants. As David said, there are probably hundreds of more variants, right? There's going to be more variants that we study. And we can't not keep updating all this information so it's not static. 
So I just want to give you some other highlights. There's some other studies that are ongoing, just so you know, within the transplant population. So this is the group up at Northwestern that are actually taking a look at a chatbot, which I thought was interesting, making it culturally appropriate in order to actually go back and give uh, genetic information, predominantly negative information. But they're actually guided by a community advisory board and a scientific advisory board. That same group in 2019 actually did multiple surveys in a focus group. But what I liked was the figure on the right that I'm showing was that really they were felt uncomfortable because the transplant nephrologists found in surgeons that there was no guidelines, there was no perspective data, which hopefully will get fixed soon. The, there was a lack of RCTs, lack of insurance coverage, lack of policy, lack of knowledge. There were just multiple things that were lacking. So people were really unaware of how to actually implement this. And people are concerned that it may slow down the transplant, expand informed consent, and have real implications to how we deliver care. And so I think those are the kind of things that we need to continue to address. There's very little done, though, within the CKD population, I think because of a lot of the things that you heard um, Kirk talk about. But I just wanted to give you some highlights in that. There's the one study uh, by uh, Dr. Lantini, who's here, Krista, who was just a pilot study done to see about chronic kidney disease, exactly what was happening within the pilot population. And on the right is actually the Guard US, a, the Guard US study, uh, which I'll go over just a little bit more. Um, and then H3 Africa has also been working with uh, Dr. Tindana here, with Dr. Du at um, Corlebu, and working on the Kidney Disease Research Network and talking about genomic research. What we think about for patient engagement and genetic testing and going back to patients in Africa is very different to what we think about in North America and likely very different to what's thought about in Europe. So if you take a look at the GUARD study, which was done now in the U.S., um, it was 15 academic uh, community sites. Over 2,000 have been randomized. And what was really interesting about this uh, project was, I won't go into the details that Kirk went into, but really they took a look and said, well, if you know your genotype, does it actually have a difference in how you're managed by the physician and how you as the patient um, manage your blood pressure? And what was very interesting was there were differences by systolic blood pressure at baseline, and uh, there was a slight increase in your urine kidney testing. But it was, a, it was a small difference that occurred between the two groups. It looks bigger here in your mean percent change of your blood pressure. But the, it went from a 3.6% change to a 1% change. And a 3.6 to a 1.3% change if you looked at the control group. So what's interesting with that, it's kind of borderline. And the question is, does genotype actually influence how people are prescribing it? I think it still needs to be uh, seen if that really lasts for a long time, or is it temporarily? And it may be because even though we test people, again, the ethics of testing people, what happens afterwards if there's no treatment? So I think there's lots more research that needs to be done. I have a lot of slides that say need more research. So um, we need to consider the clinical context. It's different if you've got chronic kidney disease, different if you've got FSGS, different if you're a transplant donor recipient. We need to think if things are actionable now because now we can do a transplant. Now we have drugs potentially. Hopefully we'll have more drugs um, in the next few years that we can actually treat people with. That'll be different. Is it a diagnostic test or is it a predictive test? And the disease prevalence may alter test characteristics of clinical validity and utility depending on which population you study. And most importantly, who gets tested? Are we going to include it in general panels that we use so that we don't infer your ancestry? But in fact, we're actually going to test everyone. Have we thought about the economic impacts of testing? And there's so many gaps in knowledge that leads to more uncertainty. And how much have we addressed the regional differences? So there are multiple frameworks to approach data to move genetic testing into clinical use. And I'm not going to go over all of them. But what I want you to see is that every country actually has requirements for us to be able to answer that question about when is it ready to move to clinical testing. And we need to really think about these multiple frameworks so we can answer those questions and make sure we provide the data in order to move forward. And these are requirements not only within the United States, but within um, required by FDA or required by EMA or required by Health Canada in order for us to be able to move testing, especially in social, more socialized healthcare systems such as Canada or Australia or the UK, in order to get it paid for um, by the, uh, not by providers, but through the health system itself. The other things that have come up as part of those frameworks include all the ethical, legal, and social implications. And what's important is that um, all the papers on the right, uh, sorry, on the left, are actually highlighting where they've really addressed all these implications to genetic testing. And what's happened is that um, 
it's really hard to find a single place where you can find all that information to make sure that we're really addressing all the things that we need in one single framework. And so I just provide one example here, which I'll go into some detail. So when you think about ethics, what I think we need to think about is it's their right to health, it's free and informed consent. How do they get results back? How do you get results of secondary findings back? Should you get secondary findings back? Do we go back and retest when there are actually protective variants that come about? How do we respect privacy and confidentiality? And how do we have respect for human dignity? We also have to think about non-discrimination. What's important is that we avoid genetic reductionism so that we start saying that everything is related to APOL1. And we know that, at least with studies in, in globally, we know that there's APOL1, there's genetic risk, but there's also environmental risk factors. And there are probably other gene modifiers. And so all of that together combines having disease. So we shouldn't just think about it as you're an APOL1 carrier, and therefore that's all we're going to test. We also need to recognize that genetic data is as important as other data, and so we shouldn't have genetic exceptionalism. And we need to avoid stigmatization. And I think I give that example of that young woman who wanted to donate to her mother. She now feels stigmatized and discriminated against, even though that was totally an unintended consequence. And so it's a question about how do we make sure that we do this correctly? There's lots of legal issues to go through, and I think I'd just point out the analytical validity and clinical utilities where most of us spend our time thinking about. Um, but there are other areas that we need to address. And the one thing I am just going to bring up, which Kirk did as well, was the 23andMe. I get nervous about direct-to-consumer testing because the question is, is that really valid? What are we going to do? And what are all the implications, and do they actually understand that? And so I'm concerned again about this direct-to-consumer, but you know, really we need to understand how many have gone through that testing and what is that implication. The next thing are the social issues. I think we need to think about counseling, preclinical and post results. There was only one study that included genetic counselors, and I think we really need to think about genetic counseling. We don't think about once you get a poll one, what's the family testing that needs to happen? Should there be familial testing? Should there be uh, genetic testing done in children? Somebody asked, should there be newborn screening? I mean, these are really big questions that we need to tackle with very little research to support them, very little data and epidemiology to understand it. So I think we need to be really cautious about how we're going to do it. Education dissemination, I've already mentioned, is really important. And reporting results. What's really important about reporting results is if we start getting to the point where your whole genome is really cheap and you can have it on a USB stick and everyone can look at it and it can be reported in electronic medical record, then where do we do all those secondary findings? So if you're in cardiology clinic and you find out you've got APOL1, are you going to be managed differently? It just happened to be found, but you've got no proteinuria, normal kidney disease. And so I think um, what we need to understand is what are going to be those ex um, expectations of patients, but also expectations of clinicians. And then there's a principle of justice. Again, we want to make sure that we don't stigmatize or discriminate people, but we're understanding in the global sense how do we actually measure the gene or test for the gene, see if you're a carrier for it, and are able to actually be actionable for uh, what you have as your underlying disease. And so, lots more research. My talk is really only questions. I have no answers. But I do want to propose that, you know, we really think broadly, and this is actually a framework that was developed for indigenous genetic testing in the U.S., but it's very important because it's based in data justice and social justice and justice among the indigenous partners. And so the question is, how can we think about it a little bit differently? And maybe we should think about that kind of framework for the testing that we want to do with APOL1. And we think a little bit differently about how we would do it. And we also make sure that we think about it globally. We shouldn't think about it just locally, for whatever region you come from. What I've found is that it's really important for us to not only think locally, but we think globally. Because we have to American, uh, remember that the African diaspora is enormous. And as I learned from my Nigerian colleagues after I visited Lagos, was that a quarter of the black population in the world is Nigerian. If you didn't know that, it was very important to find out. And so they all believe very strongly that they are all over, and it's really important that they are thought about. I also think in the U.S. that, you know, especially in kidney disease, where we learned a lot when we talked about EGFR, that we think now about race-conscious medicine, so that we're clear about ancestry being different from race. And what I think is important is that we really start talking about self-ascribed or self-determined race. We really think more about ancestry, 
And as we talk about things, just making sure that the language we use is a little bit more precise. Vanessa Grubbs wrote this provocative uh, editorial in 2021, really, again, admonishing us as nephrologists because there was a conflation of ancestry and race. And she wasn't wrong. I think that um, what we need to think about is just making sure that as we talk about APOL1, we recognize it's in a gene in everyone. There are just some variants that have a higher prevalence in one community versus another. But it's making sure that we understand what those implications are. And I'll also say that the NHGRI and the National Academies also developed a a uh, way of describing population descriptors in genetics and genomics, and I think as we move forward, we should think about using those again to make sure that we don't misappropriate or we don't think about using terminology that's sort of outdated um, and not really thinking about how we should describe uh, different populations as we study this work. And these are the different things that they think about where we should have population descriptors, uh, we should descri not use the word race, but really think about ancestry and think about genetic similarity. And there's also guidance when we publish, and I think this will change how we also use our language, so that as we start changing our uh, description of things, we should really be thinking about how to describe it appropriately. So there's two guidances that are out by JAMA. I would suggest if you haven't read them, you take a look at them, but there are things that are sort of changing as we're sort of working on this. And APOL1 has been used as an example through a number of these as areas where uh, race might have been used into, incorrectly and how we should really be using the term ancestry. And so if I go back to our medical student, you know, I think one of the things is, I think there's a lot of work for us to do, which is good for us. Um, really important for us to be able to do this work. Really important for us to address what's important to patients. What I think is so vital through all of this is, I think that patient community engagement, you're going to hear next after me as a group of patients, I think is really important to inform our research questions all the way to knowledge translation. So we don't include patients just at the time when we think we have a finding but we should start really engaging them sooner and have them be partners with us as we address these questions. And I think Apollo is a great example of having a community board that's actually active throughout the entire study is really meaningful. As we address these specific ethical, legal, social implications, we need to continue to generate this evidence because I think it's really important that we give, we sort of reduce the amount of medical uncertainty that we have and we aren't really, um, uh, you know, basing our information on limited studies, but really being much more expansive in our research. We also need to try and test genetic testing in different populations to understand what is the implications. And again, I just urge everybody to think locally and think globally. And the last thing is genetic information is only one contributor. And so we just need to think about it in the context of everything that we do for patients and make sure that we under understand that it is only a single contributor that accounts for underlying disparities in health. And I think all this reporting new guidance um, will help us in our reporting overall. So thank you for inviting me again. I recognize I've just given you a lot of thought, um, not too much data to support all of it, other than ideas or things I've been thinking about. Um, and I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you. Arulan, thank you so much for a fantastic talk. It's great to hear the patient perspective because we're all thinking about that poor young woman getting kidney failure after donating and working with the Apollo CAC has been great. Um, and also agree with everything on ancestry. Um, I'm a little afraid to bring up these two points, but Oja will cut you off. You can't yell at me too long. But, you know, we spent a lot of time at KDigo talking about it's so difficult to get a GFR, a creatinine, a UACR, and I think your comment on general testing, you know, has some risks to it because we know frequencies are extraordinarily low. There are rare patients with kidney disease that didn't know they had African ancestry, but broad screening in people without kidney disease is really, really not cost effective. And I worry that putting that out there with the costs could lose taste for genotyping the best uh, candidates. The other comment I would just make quickly in passing is, I believe that genotyping African ancestry living kidney donors will increase donation, not slow it down and delay it. I think there's a lot of fear of donating because of the familial kidney disease, and knowing if you don't have a high-risk genotype would actually be helpful. So that's just another way to look at it. Yeah, thanks, Per. I think your first comment, yeah, I agree. I think actually screening generally is going to be a huge issue, and I think that 
uh, it's all those secondary findings that people will have and then suddenly, then what, right? And, but I do wonder, you know, advocates in the genetic world really want to push, you know, in the electronic medical record that we have access to lots more information. It won't happen right now. But I do worry that, you know, it's, it's not even just APOL1. There's lots of other genes that we'll, we'll find identified, and then, and then what? Um, your point, though, about it won't uh, stigmatize or discriminate against transplantation, I think that um, I hope it doesn't. I don't think it will. I didn't, I didn't mean to say it that way. Oh, okay. I, I think I, I appreciate your potential donor's concerns. I'm just saying there are many people, African ancestry, they're afraid to donate, they worry about the risk of kidney disease that would be more free to donate if they knew they didn't have a high-risk genotype. Oh, true. Yeah, so let's say you're low-risk genotype, and then, yeah, would you then feel more comfortable donating? Yeah, absolutely. I think that would make it more common. I think... Um, Genetic testing, though, is interesting to me, is that how nervous people are about doing the genetic testing. And as if you were, and I didn't go into all the details of the surveys, but when you look at it, what was fascinating to me was people were concerned about doing a blood test even for the genetic testing, and yet they were thinking about donating their kidney or discussing donation. And I was like, okay, you know, we, we clearly have to, a lot of communication, and Ebony Bulwer has done a lot of that, and how do you communicate, you know, to the African-American community about donating in general? And now the question is, do we layer on top of that genetic testing so that it's, under, you know, that it's clear and we're communicating in a culturally appropriate way? We'll take uh, two more questions for Dr. Parekh. Uh, if uh, this works, but otherwise I'll project. Oh, it's working. So I, I probably echo uh, Barry's concern also that maybe I'll reframe my concern as I'm concerned about fear of paralysis. And what do I mean? I see the, the National Academy recommendation about don't use race, don't use ancestry, uh, use genetic ancestry if you can. Most people don't know their genetic ancestry. In the U.S., most people that would develop kidney disease from APOL1, majority of them are self-identified black, African-American, or African ancestry. So if we, if we start from, uh, if the goal is inclusiveness, screen everybody, I worry that that group that is most at risk would be overlooked by that dilutional effect. That's my concern. And secondly, on the, on the part of the researcher and caregiver, I see it in a lot of my colleagues. They actually now worry to approach a, a obviously black person. They say, well, I don't want to feel like I'm picking on you because you are black, right? So this is actually where I think self-identified race is actually a benefit. Uh, especially a lot of my colleagues that are not African-American or black are sort of a little skittish about using race when it's right in front of you. So I think people don't really have what is available to use for identifying potential patients. You have a black patient in front of you, screen them, right? But they don't want, so you can't use race, you can't use ancestry, you can't, what can you use? So I think people are sort of left in a void and I think it may lead to paralysis. That's my concern. So I think that's totally fair because I think that we need to make sure our studies are reflective of the communities that we serve. And so what we need to have is we need to make sure that we're collecting the data about self-described, like who are they, and then make sure that our study populations are truly reflective of what we're trying to get to. I think the argument that I would say for APOL1 though, let's say within the FSGS group, why not if we already know that there's 80 Mendelian genes that we test for, if we add APOL1 and make it 81, there's going to be 100 eventually, then we would be screening everybody with FSGS regardless of ancestry because we're going to genotype everybody, right? So theoretically, but when you recruit into those studies, your table one should still describe your population that you've got. And we should continue to make sure that our study populations reflect the communities that we live in. And therefore, they should, if that's an FSGS group, and that's 80% of those who self-report as African-American or black, then that's totally appropriate. And that's where I'm trying to sort of, you know, uh, for us to think about, is that we use the terms when we're talking about our populations in our table one and our descriptors. When we start moving towards talking about ancestry or we're talking about genetic testing, then we can start describing the ancestry. And what they ask you to do in the, in the population part is then you describe the ancestry and then you describe the genetics related to the ancestry because we need to make sure that we get away from people even thinking or saying those kind of things where that's a black gene, right? And that's the, I think that's the phrase that we need to, uh, that's the nuances that we need to think about, right? It's, the, it's recruiting into the population. I agree though about the paralysis because it means that 
I think that studies need to then be consistent where we are choosing a large self-described group. I mean, the advantage that we had when we did our discovery study was, in FIND, was that it was a, a predominant, it was a 100% population that identified as black or African American, and then that's the group that we studied, right? And so I think if we continue to do studies like that, that's totally appropriate and should be continued. Um, what I'm saying though is when you move it to clinical testing, how are you going to do that depending on where you live? So I now live in Canada where I have a huge, large Caribbean group that um, some of them self describe uh, as they may be from the white population or they don't know. And they think they might have some African ancestry, but they don't know. And so then the question is, but they, don't, but they don't belong to the black community. So then do I not do genetic testing them at all? And I think then it varies. But I do agree your point is that we shouldn't get to paralysis. We should still be activists about it, but we should just make sure that we're sort of uh, careful about how we have those nuances. So I agree, we should be careful and not, not, not do work, right? We just have a lot of work to do, that's it. Afshin. One more question I heard. Okay, so just, I mean, what, maybe we need to stop thinking so much about just APOL, one genetic testing, and whom, but really who needs genetic testing, which goes a lot beyond just APOL one. If you have a potential donor to a parent and the parent has kidney disease, black, white, blue, shouldn't per maybe just be APOL one, it should be a more comprehensive panel. And if we're thinking about early on, you know, like, you know, discussions always about, you know, at birth or so on, and that brings up a whole other set of discussions that we won't get into here, but maybe that should be whole sequence. Why just APOL1? I mean, I, I love the topic, I'm a nephrologist <laughs> and a researcher in it, but there's really a world of risk uh, that is much bigger than that. So maybe the next step is really just genetic testing, and hopefully when that becomes more normal, this genetic exceptionalism where people think, you know, because you have a twofold risk for CKD to, to a gene is so scary, but not if your blood pressure is 138, which has the same risk, or other factors that are associated with more risk and just bring it back into the realm of clinical medicine. I think that, I think that would unify it all and make it much easier. I think the hard part is in transplantation, for example, there aren't other many things that we would test for. And I, think, uh, and I think that makes it hard. So then we focus in on the one that's the most actively known and the most that we have most data on. So I think that's part of the issue is that we don't have all that information. But I think ultimately, maybe in 5, 10, 15 years, we'll be able to say we're doing the panel and April 1 just happens to be part of the genes. And that's hopefully where we get to. Thank you very much, Dr. Thomas.